started here. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, uh, completion seminars are coming pretty fast and furious now. So um, there are a couple of upcoming seminars that are outside of regular seminar time. So there's going to be another completion at 1 o'clock today in uh, 183. Um, I failed to write down who that was. So does anybody know who's finishing? Jared. Jared. Primer. Primer, right. Okay. One o'clock today in 183. And then on Monday, Ming Stevens at 8 o'clock in the morning in 202. And Tuesday, um, Claire Lacane at, uh, um, at 10 o'clock in 160. So those are all coming up in the next couple of days, and those next ones I will send a reminder out about and send the abstracts out um, later today. Okay. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce Randy Johnson, a uh, student of uh, Jenks. John Jenks, yep. and he'll be talking about ecology of mountain lions in the North Dakota Badlands. Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, and thanks to the guys online too, and gals. That's usually where I catch these things, so shout out to them. But yeah, we're gonna talk about mountain lions today. So a little bit of background information just to get everybody up to speed. Um, mountain lions are native to North Dakota. They occurred there historically uh, throughout the state, but primarily out west uh, in the rugged areas of the state, the Badlands, uh, et cetera. But human persecution, <coughs> led to their demise. They were all but extirpated by uh, the turn of the 20th century, about. Um, then during the 1960s, all across the western part of the country, uh, most of the states afforded lions some protection through, through managing them as game species, closing the seasons, uh, eliminating bounty programs, those types of things. And that allowed the population to, to, to stabilize and to slowly rebound. And as their numbers increased, they slowly moved back east, and that includes into North Dakota. So again, this is a, a natural recolonization of the state. They did it completely on their own. There was nobody with lions in a trailer or anything like that. So I just wanted to clear, clarify that. Um, this, by, by about the year 2000, it was evident that there was a breeding population in the Badlands, and the initial harvest season took place in 2005. Um, currently, the state manages the harvest through a, through a zone one and zone two. If you can see, uh, zone one is the smaller unit and that's essentially the source population. That's where we find most of the lions. Outside of that is generally considered unsuitable habitat and there's no harvest quota there. Within zone one, there's a harvest quota with a, with a varying season structure. Um, the use of hounds is used during part of the year. Um, I can clarify that later too. Uh, that's my study area. You can see we're with all within zone one, covered a pretty expansive chunk of ground there. So one thing I wanted to point out was when I'm talking about the North Dakota Badlands, I don't want you to picture the South Dakota Badlands because they are in fact quite different, primarily by the vegetation. You can see that the vast majority of the North Dakota Badlands is short grass prairie with lots of junipers and cedar trees mixed all throughout. In the riparian areas, there's good stands of cottonwood trees, um, some elms and ashes and those types of things. So the big difference is, is the vegetation. So keep that in mind as we go. Um, there's one other distinct thing that sets the Badlands apart, and that is that it's part of the Bakken oil field. Now, if you don't know what the Bakken oil field is, it's one of the busiest places, well, it's probably the busiest place in North Dakota, but it's, it's a, a very, um, it produces a lot of oil. It's very busy. Um, it's really taken off in the last 15 years or so. And you can see in this picture, that's just a screenshot from Google Earth, there's lots and lots of roads all throughout the Badlands, primarily as a result of the, the energy development. Um, of course, with that, you have lots and lots of traffic, usually, um, and flaring. That's what the bottom picture shows. That's kind of a byproduct of these oil wells. Um, it leads, it's kind of loud for one, but primarily it's, it's light pollution. Um, these things go around the clock, and in some areas it gets to be pretty bright. So you add these things up, and you have a pretty distinct uh, need for some research. Um, 
anytime you have a top level predator coming back into a system, of course there's questions about how is this affecting the wildlife? We've got elk, mule deer, whitetails, bighorn sheep, etc., cetera, um, as well as the livestock. There's, there's cattle grazing all throughout the Badlands, um, but we also have horses, there's, there's sheep, um, goats. So there's, there's lots of questions there. How are these things impacting these different groups? Um, as well as on the flip side, how are we affecting the lions? Between the hunting season, depredation, road kills, obviously the energy development and all that traffic, how is that having an impact on these lions coming back? Uh, so to address these needs, the state teamed up with SDSU to begin a pretty extensive research project. Um, it began in 2011. Dave Wilkins was the student here um, under Jenks, and his objective was essentially to gather some baseline information. This was the first time the population had been studied ever. Um, so a lot of this stuff was more speculative than anything, so we wanted to get some numbers on it. Um, initial survival estimates, home range size, movements, and the big one was the food habits. Essentially trying to get an idea of what lions were eating, how often they were eating, and relate that back to impacts on the wildlife and the livestock. And then my project picked up where he left off, phase two um, in 2014, and my objectives were essentially to build upon and expand uh, what, what was started in phase one. So the first objective of my project was to add a couple years of data to refine these estimates of survival, home range, movements, et cetera. Um, two, we wanted to look at resource selection, which essentially is what habitats lions were using and selecting for and which ones they didn't like, which ones were they avoiding. Uh, and then finally, the third objective was to synthesize all this information we gathered over the last five years and produce two things, a, a statewide habitat suitability map as well as a population model to try and estimate abundance and look at the trajectory of the population as well. So, how are you going to do this? You have to catch lions and put collars on them. That's the only way you get this information. Um, most western states rely on hounds to capture lions. We chose to go a different route uh, for several reasons. The biggest one is we have juniper trees that stand 10, 15 feet tall, not ponderosa pines that are much taller. So treeing lions in North Dakota is much more difficult. Usually when they bay, they end up in a cave or a hole in the ground somewhere. And it's possible, but it's much more difficult, uh, especially for the guy that's gotta crawl in there and dart the thing. So we instead used, chose to use bait sites um, with foothold traps to capture lions, with the basic idea being pick up lots of roadkill, scout areas for lion sign, and then anytime you found something that looked promising, go place a bait, monitor it with cameras, and then between my technician and I, we check these things about every three days or so. Uh, with the idea being, when a lion hits a bait, hopefully he'll eat it, hopefully he'll be there quick enough to catch him on it, then put the trap in, then catch the lion. So this is see that very well. That's a typical bait site setup. You can see the deer kind of in the middle there. Um, just a few things to point out. The idea was to make a cubby set with one way in and one way out. And that's where the star is. That's where the trap goes in. The trap is anchored to the base of a tree. And then you'll notice all of the brush up that tree and like for 10 feet around the tree is cleared out and loose. And then I piled it all to make these walls on both sides. So again, the line has one way in and one way out. And when done like this, it's not only efficient, but it's very, very safe for the animal too. We had, we had no injuries. Um, once the lion's caught, he, has, he or she has freedom to move all the way around. We've got springs, we've got swivels, we've got lots of modifications to the traps to make it as safe as possible. And as you can see, they actually spent a surprising amount of time just sitting there between the time they got caught and us getting there. They weren't very happy, but <laughs> we got there as quick as possible. Um, so once we caught a lion, we used chemical mobilization, uh, we'd remove him from the trap, fit him with a GPS collar, um, everybody got a unique ear tag, we would weigh them, we would sex them, estimate the age, um, we collected some different body measurements, looked for injuries, parasites, all kinds of things, um, and then if I had time I would extract a, a premolar tooth, which is right behind one of the big canines, a really small vestigial tooth, 
Um, if I could get that out, then that would allow us to verify the age to the exact year. Uh, once we got what we needed, I would administer the reversal. We'd step back, wash the line, wake up, and recover. The whole process took about 60 to 90 minutes. So pretty quick, pretty efficient. This is the only time you have your study animal in hand, so you gotta get everything you can as quick as possible, because in fact, most of these I never saw again. Um, of course, everything was IACUC approved here at SDSU. So, data analysis, um, survival, known fate analysis in program mark, staggered entry design, pretty standard. Home ranges, uh, calculated with the Brownian bridge method in program R. Resource selection, this is a little bit more intensive analysis. So this is a brief summary. Um, the collars were set to collect three locations a day per lion. After I had all these locations from all these cats, I had thousands of locations. So I, I divided them into summer and winter seasons, and then I created what are called uh, uh, resource selection functions uh, by fitting generalized linear models to the, the locations in program R. So the, the basic idea is you look at the habitat attributes of these used locations and compare that to the attributes of these uh, randomly available locations. And by comparing use to availability, you get an idea of what habitats and, and resources lines were using, <coughs> which ones they were avoiding. If, if use equaled random, then you know it didn't really make a difference. Um, I used a two-stage modeling approach, and that simply means I created resource selection functions for each individual, and then to approximate the population level, I just averaged the coefficients across individuals to come up with one population level resource selection function. Using that, I created the habitat suitability map. So these are the eight variables that I used in the resource selection functions as well as the map. I'm just gonna list them real quick instead of going into them, but if you wanna come back to that, we can. Um, land cover, aspect, disturbance, landscape ruggedness, elevation, slope, distance to water, and distance to edge. Um, edge was defined as the forest boundary. So these were all things that we we thought were important, as well as uh, previous literature on this. That's how we came up with this list. Um, so yeah, once I had the population level resource selection function, I took that, those coefficients, multiplied them back by these rasters, so that each pixel in the raster had a value from high to low, relating it back to whether or not lions liked that resource. Um, to, to validate this thing, to see how well it performed, I set aside two lines at the very beginning that I didn't use to make the map. And then I also gathered a list of verified reports from across the state in areas where we never had um, collared lions. And then finally, the population model. I used a technique called statistical population reconstruction um, with a fairly new program called Pop Recon. And this is fairly new to the wildlife field. Um, but the basic idea is that you use this joint likelihood model here um, with several different inputs. The main input being agent harvest data. That's simply um, every line that's harvested in the state is reported to the state and aged. Um, so we have all that information and then hunter effort. More effort usually means more harvest. Um, I didn't have good data for that, so I had to approximate it the best I could um, using the number of lions killed and the quota for that year. Um, but within the program, you go ahead and you can configure the different harvest and survival probabilities um, to be year specific or age specific. And you can create different model structures that way, and compare them. Um, you need some independent auxiliary data to complete the likelihood. Uh, for that, I use our five years of mark recapture data from the collared lines. And then finally, you have to tell it how well these things are reported. Is every line that's killed reported to the state and included? Or is it 50% or is it unknown? For us, it was near 100%, but there was a few years missing, so I did year specific. Okay, some results. I captured nine lions while I was up there. Four adults, three sub-adults, and two kittens. Um, overall, it was, it was three males and six females. Um, seven of them got collars. The two kittens, I call them kittens, but they were 60 pounds. They, just, they weren't quite large enough to get a collar yet. Um, but everybody, like I said, had a unique ear tag. And then on top of that, I was able to get pictures of this individual here. That's a female that was marked during the first phase of research. Her collar failed pretty quickly. Um, she, she no longer has it on, but she still has her ear tag. 
between that and a few other features, we were able to confirm that it was her. Um, and I got her pretty consistently throughout my study area. So I included her in the survival. Um, but also it's kind of neat because she's at least eight to nine years old at this point. So she's survived a long time out there. Um, and then just to note too, I coupled my data with uh, stuff collected during phase one, um, additional, si additional 16 mountain lions. So for most of this, we have pretty, pretty solid sample size. Um, these are the survival results um, calculated across the five years from 21 individual lions. I had two models come out to be uh, darn near the same. Um, both included sex and late season variables. The other one included year. But I chose the sex and late season model as my top model simply because the year, um, I think it relates back to differences in sample sizes between years and nothing biologically meaningful. These other two variables, you can relate back to biology. The sex of the individual, males travel more during the day, so they are usually more susceptible, particularly to the hound hunters. On the other hand, there's more females on the landscape than males. Um, additionally, the, the last year of the study, there was a, a slight change in regulations which tried to protect some of the females, so I think that also elevated our female survival. Um, the late season, that refers to the time of the year when, when hound hunting is allowed, and that is the most efficient way to hunt lions, um, and that means that that season, that season has its own individual quota, um, but it's filled relatively quickly every year, and, and it's always filled. Um, so, from that model, average annual survival across the five years, um, average 61.3%, uh, breaking it into male and female. The females did much better out there, 73 uh, than did the males, about 40%. Home range size was calculated from 13 different lions. Um, I did annual, winter, and summer. Just a couple to point out real quick. Um, the males averaged nearly 300 square kilometers. Females, a little less than half of that, 128. If you're trying to do the math, I did it for you, it's 114 square miles and about 50 square miles. So these things cover a lot of ground. Um, these estimates fall right within the range of lots of other studies across the country. So there's nothing eye popping here. Um, if anything, these estimates are on the low side of, of what's been documented, which could indicate that this habitat is, is really good. They don't have to range nearly as far. Um, one other thing to point out too, you can see in both sexes, the, the winter home ranges were quite a bit smaller than the summer, and that's to be expected as well. There's, there's snow on the ground, they don't want to move as far, it's easier to stay put a little bit, um, and, and the prey probably doesn't move quite as far either. Okay, some quick population level uh, results from the resource selection. Again, this is a simplified version of it, but essentially we saw universal selection for the distance to edge category, landscape ruggedness, and the forest land covers. While at the same time, we saw a pretty universal avoidance of the disturbance variable and these other uh, land covers that are pretty much human um, development. Um, this all relates back to their style of hunting. Lions are a stock and ambush predator, so they need these types of features, rugged, uh, forested landscapes with lots of edge to get close to their prey to launch an attack. That's how they work. And you can't stock up on a deer if you're on a flat pool table, right? So that, it makes sense. Um, the similar patterns have been documented in other places. Of course, they, they try to stay away from this, this um, human development as well. Part of the disturbance category, if you notice the beta coefficient is fairly high there, or fairly low, which one, whichever way you want to look at it. I think that relates back to the fact that disturbance and ruggedness are kind of inversely related. Most of the development occurs in areas that are relatively not rugged, because that's where you can put a road and an oil pad. So I think that's inflated a little bit because of that. Um, on a population level, the rest of the category, or the rest of the variables did not have much influence. So that's just a visualization of it. Um, Little human impact, lots of topographic complexity, forest, and good amounts of edge. That's what they liked. Okay, taking those those values, um, again, multiplying them back by those, those landscape rasters, and then adding them up, the, the original map, 
each pixel had a value between 9.7 and 12.4. And these are just basic or relative values. The higher the number, the more suitable, the more um, better, if you will, for, for lions. So that's cool in its own way. You can compare areas to each other, but it doesn't make a very pretty map. So I took these values and I stretched them to be between negative 100 and positive 100, and then took the histogram of the pixel values. Okay, and then I made the assumption that anything above zero, where the sum of it is is considered good, um, anything above zero is good, and then the very upper tail in purple there, I considered that excellent quality. Below zero, the very first one, I kind of considered as a marginal habitat. Um, it's places that a lion could use for a short period of time, but eventually they're gonna to wanna to get out of there and get back to these better quality habitats. Below that in the white, unsuitable, and the very lower tail is uns highly unsuitable. Um, and open water was kind of just dealt with separately the whole time throughout. Um, so this is what the final result looked like for the habitat suitability map. Um, a couple things to point out. The green, that's the good quality. The purple is the excellent quality. I know it's probably hard to see, but most of the purple occurs right up in here. Um, this essentially is the Badlands. So most of the good and excellent quality habitat occurs in the Badlands. But we also see some up along uh, the northern Missouri River breaks, along Lake Sakakawea, even extending down along the Missouri towards Bismarck. Um, we also see a few spots over here along some riparian areas in the eastern part of the state that are okay. Um, these are the Turtle Mountains. A good chunk of that was identified as good habitat, along with the Pembina Gorge. Um, in my thesis, I speculate a little bit as to whether or not those areas can support a breeding population. The short answer is no. The source population is restricted to this area over here. Zooming into the Badlands, a couple things to notice. Right away, most of it occurs north of I-94. Um, furthermore, the distribution of excellent quality habitat, the purple stuff, is not equal throughout. Most of the excellent quality habitat occurs across the northern badlands. And this was kind of expected because most of the harvested lions come out of this area as well. And the farther south you go, particularly once you cross the interstate, there's less and less reports of lions, less and less harvested, and most of it reflects differences in habitat. The, the, the habitat up north is more rugged, it's more forested. The further south you go, it starts to turn into rolling hill type stuff. Um, it becomes more patchy, more space in between, and, and that reflects in the map. Now the validation, real quickly, um, this one is the zone one, so again, within this area here. Um, I overlaid the locations used to make the map onto the map and then saw where they fell. You can see it's skewed highly to the right. That means most of them fell in good and excellent quality habitats, and that's what you would want. Um, this refers to the two lines I set aside to begin with. They didn't validate quite as well, but still very, very good, um, and that's to be expected. That's an indication that other lines that were not used to make the map should, uh, the map should predict their, their use. Well. And then finally, the bottom one is the zone two out of sample validation. That's all these these verified reports, all of the blue triangles. Those have happened over the years, road kills, uh, trail camera pictures, all kinds of things. Um, you can see it didn't validate nearly as well, but it's still skewed to the right. Um, now one thing to point out, I'm okay with that because this map was never designed to, to predict um, where dispersing lions would go. This is all based on resident adult mountain lions which means this map is designed to, to map areas where you would find a breeding population of resident adult mountain lions. Not necessarily where you could have a disperser show up, because lions have and, and will show up just about anywhere. Okay, finally the population model. Um, a couple things to point out. You can see a general increase and then a general decrease. Um, the peak occurred back in 2011-12, around 180 lions. Um, the low was this past year. It estimates about 23, but I put a star there for a couple of reasons. Again, this is a fairly new program and it has a few things that need to be worked out. Um, 
that, that's one of the results here is there's a few kinks in it. So that number of 23 I think is low. I think it's closer to 40 or 50. Um, we can go into that a little bit more if anybody has questions. But again, the takeaway message is that it's going down. So discussion to wrap this up, uh, estimated survival about 61%. That's below the, the number that's generally uh, considered to be sustainable, 65%. Home ranges, uh, nothing shocking there. Most of the suitable habitats in the badlands um, and in the population model, even though it needs improvements, um, it still offers the best estimates of abundance to date. So going forward, North Dakota uh, certainly has sufficient habitat for a small population of lions, but right now it's in a drastic decline, and most of the mortality is human-induced between harvest um, and then non-harvest mortality as well. So going forward, I think the state needs to revisit the hunting season structure as well as the quota, um, and then continue to, to update this model going forward. Lots of people to thank, lots of agencies, my technicians, lots of landowners, et cetera, my advisor, John Jenks. And finally, any questions? Yes, sir. You said late season came out as one of the models or the variables in the mortality model? Yes. I didn't see any results on that. Was it just a lot higher late like, season during the hunting yes. season? Yes. I didn't pull it out separately, but yes, that's Would like you I said. That's... the costume, please? Oh, sure. Um, he asked about the, the survival results, and the late season variable was important. It's important in both. I didn't pull it out separately because it's one month out of the year. It's basically December. Like I said, that's when hounds are, are allowed, um, so it just drops survival during that month. Most of the harvested lions take place during that month. So I didn't pull it out because it relates back to that. I didn't think we needed a necessarily an extra survival estimate for that time. Um, but that's what it relates to. So. Yes? Randy, what would the population be if there wasn't any hunting? That's a good question. Um, during some of these years, During these years up here, there was actually as many, if not more, lions killed out of season. So I've got a little bit of evidence that I'm working with right now that almost shows <coughs> that hunting, of course, has its impact, but these out of season mortalities, like the depredation, the road kills, the poaching, is almost more responsible for that. It can sustain a decent level of hunting, but when you have that plus all this other stuff going on, it really drops it down. So I think. You can see that the population seems to be leveling out right now, and within the last three, four years, there's only been a handful of out-of-season mortalities going on, while the, the harvest has remained about a dozen animals. So I think if we continue that dozen animals, but don't have that out-of-season stuff, I think it will stabilize and maybe even go back up. Um, based on the habitat suitability map, I, I threw some density estimates into there, and I projected it across the landscape. And it came up to say between about 40 and 60 adult residents. So you add in some kittens and some sub-adults. I would say, I mean, this is speculatory, but you could sustain around 100 total cats, I think. So what's the cost-benefit analysis? You know, because, so somebody has to get a license, and the state has to manage the population. Yep. Is the 12 worth a hassle, or, or is it like, Two, three thousand dollars per license. You want to get that? Kind of. There, there's really no separate line license. It's just part of the fur bear license. So anybody that buys a regular, basically a regular hunting license, a combination or big game or anything, can take lions. So there's really not a huge component there. Um, there are several people that have hounds and things, and that's a lot of money there. So maintaining the ability for those guys to go out and dedicate their time to lion hunting, I think is definitely worthwhile. Um, but how much does the state invest in understanding this population, this question? So they have to expend resources to understand it, right? and then they allow 12 to be harvested. Is, you know, it, it sounds like it's a service of, you know, that they're providing. Sure. And I wonder, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, you know we, we have to use special license to kind of pay for people's salaries and things like that. that. 
that's kind of where I was getting at. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not it's, like a base board. Yeah. I mean, just it's it's more than just hunting too, right? I mean, you have impacts on livestock. People want to know how many are out there, where are they at, those types of things. So the actual money generated by selling these hunting licenses is next to nothing. But like you say, it is a service. It's back to not just the hunting community, but it really extends to everybody. So, yes? So Randy, you said the survival of females was a lot greater than males. Yes. And I was wondering if that was something artificial? Is it from hunting regulations or is it biologically meaningful and what would you expect the sex ratio to be? That's that's typical of a hunted population. Well, actually any population, like where it was. Um, <clears throat> generally, females do better for a couple of reasons. Like I said, when, when the hound guys are out there, the size of the track, if it's bigger, usually means it's a male. That's one they target. Oh. Right? Um, on top of that, Male survival is usually lower, particularly in the subadult fades when they're they're leaving their home range and they take off. So those are the ones that are most likely to get hit on the road, most likely to cause trouble and be removed, those types of things. Whereas most of the female subadults stay close to their natal range. So that helps elevate their survival as well. And then, like I said, this last year of the season, um, a female sub quota was introduced, which essentially meant that people were avoiding trying to shoot females. So I think that did elevate a little bit too. Yep. Yes. In the beginning, I think you mentioned that Wilkins started the research in 2011, is that right? Yep. So what are the population estimates in 2005 to 2011 based off of? Um, well, it's all based off of the age and harvest data. So all of the lions that were killed in the state, both harvest and non-harvest, comes back into, you set it up so where each year has X number of cats killed, and they're each aged, and then you can kind of back, back calculate that way. So the hunting season began in 2005, 2006, that's where I got the data. So up until his point, it was all based on, well actually the whole thing is based on the age and harvest data. So harvest is included in all of it? Yep, yep. Does that make sense? The, the collared information that I entered occurred over here um, because we just simply didn't have anything going back. But it tries to estimate um, it, its own survival and, and harvest probabilities. And I looked at them, they seemed pretty reasonable. So this big drop here, I don't think happened. I think it's pretty stable going up. Um, There's a couple of zeros in the age of harvest data that for some reason dropped it way down. But if you calculate it, or, or if you kind of fix that manually, it brings something back up. Yes? Um, you know, the it's very similar to statistical catch it or kill it age model in fisheries, right? You're just reconstructing yes. the past. Yep. So that in recruitment variability is the one thing that blows those things up. Did you, in monitoring natality, did you assume a fixed survival rate of um, kittens? Or did you try to yes. capture a dynamic I tried. I tried both. Like, like I mentioned, you can you can kind of adjust that year specific or age specific survival. Um, my top model actually ended up being natural survival was constant across ages and years, but the harvest probabilities were dependent on year and age. So I think that accounted for, you know, in the harvest, the the, the fewest animals are those zero to one year olds because they're basically with mom all the time. So we didn't have a lot of information there. Um, but it did its best to try and to try and calculate that. We did have some zero to one year olds on um, collar too, so that gives some additional auxiliary estimate as well. There. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's it's all based on fisheries science. It's finally making its way into the wildlife field a little bit. Can you say that a little louder? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you just um, reflect on? I'm just curious. What math? statistics classes from an undergrad and from a grad give you that confidence to do what you did? I'm just curious, like what math level classes and then what kind of stats classes? Well, I just took the basic 281 and 541. So I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not an expert on this, the very detailed math behind that. Part of the reason it's now just getting the wildlife field is that it's very statistically heavy. I probably wouldn't have been able to do this without that new program. It just came out like a year and a half ago, 
and it was designed specifically for fur bearing in, in these types of populations that have relatively low harvest, but everything's recorded. Um, so this is still a little bit of a rough draft. I'm still going back and trying to figure out why this type of stuff is happening and increase my confidence in this. Um, but yeah, I've, the program is designed so that the average biologist can do it, <coughs> but certainly you want to have more of an understanding behind it than that. So I'm still trying to get completely my head wrapped around it. Um, but at this point, I have, I have pretty good confidence that this thing is, is accurate. Um, partly because I talked with Dave when he was up there and threw some numbers at him. Both of us agree that these numbers are accurate based on what we saw. We covered the majority of the Badlands with our cameras. We were out there every single day. Um, I always thought a number about 50 seemed appropriate for what I saw. Between having six or seven collars out there, cameras everywhere, um, you know, so we had our eyes on X number of lines throughout our couple years there. We both agreed that that number seems very appropriate. How does the model know to put that much variation on? It seems like it's really a lot. It is a lot. Part of that is because we don't have a huge sample size. I, I've only got, in, in some of these early years particularly, you see that one even in two of zero, um, there's like seven individuals. So the more individuals you get, it should bring it down. Um, there's just a lot going on. And, and also you, you can't really, I can't separate it by sex. Can't, I, I can separate by age, but the sex is the big one at this point. As, as I just showed, male and female sex survival is pretty different, but the model doesn't let me incorporate that yet. That's one improvement they're trying to make. So I think that could be part of it as well. And they're just it's just like a Windows platform, right? The, yeah, the program. pretty much, yeah. yeah. What are these error bars? Are they SEs, 95% confidence? 95%, yeah. 95% confidence intervals? Yep, okay. yep. Like I said, this year is a little bit low too. I think it's pretty much flat lining right now. Do you have data on livestock losses and do the livestock loss numbers um, correlate with those population estimates? Um, yes and kind of. <laughs> we have, from Dave's project, um, he showed he, he investigated, I think, 500 kill sites from lines. So when a lion kills something, the GPS collar will, will cluster there. And he hiked in on like 500 of them. And I think only one of his 14 lions actually killed livestock. Um, and that one was removed right away. So the vast majority are not impacting livestock in any big way. Um, but how about other other kills that were identified as mountain lion kills that were not from collared animals. Right, even that, very good. Um, that doesn't mean that people, a lot of them basically free range them, so they have X number of cows and they should have X number of calves come fall and they don't. And a lot of it's attributed back to lions, even though we don't have much evidence to support that. Um, the number of like depredations and things is going down with this trend. Which I think does validate certainly the trend. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, there's been no road kills this year, no depredation calls um, or, or removals anyway. Um, so I think it, it does does match up pretty well. Yes. Sorry, one last thing, and I'll put a bug in here. The, we thought about is this a maybe a compensatory response to a population that's been unharvested for years and as you start to in include harvest that the population's compensating somehow, either increased survival of young or decreased dispersal distance of males, um, something, because they just in you know, unexploited fish population, you see this boom right away a few years afterwards, it's usually recruitment goes way up, so right. then it comes back down to stable. There's, that's something I'm looking into right now too, but most of the research on lions shows that there's not much compensatory mortality. If you start removing cats, the survival doesn't really increase much. Um, the dispersal may play into it. They might take off more, but if you kill cats, then there's more open areas, so then they might not have to leave anyway. So the evidence suggests that it's not very compensatory. Um, but like I was saying too with mine, even though harvest has stayed fairly similar, these, these non-harvest mortalities are going down, so there might be something there. I'm looking into that right now. Um, I think we 
you start to talk about the group source selection on your, so I didn't know, maybe you mentioned I missed them. How does group source selection link to your pack pack suitability? Yes, it's a really good question. Obviously, for any of this to be valid, they have to have sufficient prey, right? If there's no nothing to eat there, they can't be there, no matter what the habitat's like. I tried to incorporate that. Unfortunately, I couldn't because the data just wasn't coarse enough or, or fine enough. It's very, very coarse data. So I wasn't able to incorporate that. However, there's a there's a mule deer study going on for the past five, six years with over 100 animals collared, and only five were killed by lions. Four were actually killed by coyotes. Um, so the evidence suggests that prey is not a limiting factor throughout the backline. I follow that question, how do you think about, you know, you talk about the big difference, the Badland is North Dakota, different South Dakota due to vegetation. Yep. Does vegetation composition more important or vegetation structure and how that makes the, you know, the prey population and link with your, uh, the, uh, the line, mountain lion population? If I follow what you're asking, yes. I, I showed some of the southern badlands. It's, it's less rugged and there's more grass. And actually, I think, based on what I saw, there's actually more prey down there than what there is in some of that more excellent quality habitat based on the landscape. Um, so again, prey doesn't seem to be a limiting factor at this time, but where there's more excellent quality lion habitat, you would assume there's higher density of cats there, which could then impact the lion population. So is it, is it the landscape that's supporting less deer, or is it the fact that there's higher density in there? That's something to look at. Actually, the, the mule deer study, he's creating a similar map for mule deer, and we're hoping to lay them on top of each other and take a look and see how they line up. I think that would be really interesting. Thank so, you. work in progress. Great. Do we have any questions from remote people? <coughs> Almost forgot to ask him to have such a good time in here. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, thank you.